Next speaking will be Teresa Jefferson, our uh, librarian, uh, Oviat librarian for business and data. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for staying. Um, <laughs> it's been a great, I don't know if this is a symposium, the great day of data. I really have enjoyed it. I'm, I'm here to just briefly give you an overview about what the library is providing um, as far as, so I'm an instruction librarian. I provide um, instruction for our students about business and data literacy. So a lot of my publications and what I'm interested in is teaching students how to understand, um, consume, and um, contribute to the data ecosystem. So I would like to sh just briefly show you how to get some information through the library about um, what is available um, as open access data. So starting from the library homepage, um, you can just do a simple search at the top screen for the word data. So this, this is just searching the entire library. And so what you'll see um, are a few different options. Um, I have a guide for open data sets. That's what I'm going to show you. There's also, this is just a repeat of the, the above. Then there's the uh, data management planning guide. And then there's also um, a little bit of an overview on what, what it is that we do here for data literacy. So um, encompassing this guide, there's some data citation, and I do include um, some data cite in there, and a little bit about data management planning, how to share data, data sharing for students that are actually gathering and, and um, submitting their own data for other people to use, um, data visualization, how to actually create just that, and then open data sets for students that want to actually find data to use. So I'll just show you briefly the guide for open data sets. So I've blocked based on subject. So there's an energy data um, block. There's polling, um, both US and international polls. There's also some environmental statistics, um, sports, health statistics, labor statistics, um, transportation. Then there's, of course, elections and voting data for the US and then the international. Um, education data. And I think I skipped something here. Um, the economic and financial data. And then there's the demographic and socio-demographic data um, data sets and statistics. And then there's um, some criminal justice data. And then there's a whole block on census, census data, um, including the American Fact Finder, which I also teach students how to use. And then specifically for my business students, I teach them how to use the economic census. And there's some chemistry data, and I'd be happy to um, work with you, Juicy, if you have some additional data sets that you can help me add to this block. And then other specialized data sets that a lot of students um, might be interested in that aren't really classified in any, any specific area. So that's essentially where I point my students where they're, if they're looking for some open data, usually based on what they're interested in, might fit into one of these blocks. So just so you know that that is available. And then um, there's some information about data visualization. So um, the ways that a lot of my colleagues like to present information are using infographics. So sometimes students might actually have projects to create infographics or might be able to use infographics. So there's a lot of free open source infographic um, creations, creation software. And then um, there's some other info art tools. So we like to help our students to um, visualize their, their information that they're getting and give them some open source tools to do that. And so here's a guide on other uh, resources that students might want to use for visualization. And then we also share with our students some repositories where they can not only access um, data, but also if, they're, if they create their own data, what they might want to submit to. And ScholarWorks is here as well. And then there's some information on data citation. And Every 
every place will have their own way of how they want things cited. So um, the I also when I'm teaching the census to my students, there's the census has their own way of how they want things cited. So I always give that information as well. And data management planning. My little image isn't working right there, but um, there's some information that leads us back to that Office of um, Research and Sponsored Projects where Chris Kachikian works and um, our relationship with the library and how, how we're trying to bridge those, um, the research and projects that faculty have. And we want, we want people and gra um, graduate faculty and students, graduate, uh, graduate students and, and teaching faculty to, to utilize um, both what the library can offer as, as far as helping create these relationships with um, data citation, data sharing, and then um, helping with the, the sponsored projects that you have. And there's some additional resources if you are looking and creating data management plans that I have outlined below that other institutions make readily available, like MIT, University of Minnesota, North Carolina State, um, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, um, um, ICPSR, um, University of Colorado Boulder, Purdue, Carnegie Mellon, and Tufts at UMass. So all of these have really great um, insights on creating data management plans as well. And they're very easily available and ready to use. It's just my brief overview on what we have here available for everybody to use. Any questions? So that first thing that you covered, um, could you, uh, like, why are we doing this? It seems like it's something that, uh, I don't know, it seems like something that the US government might do or something like that, um, or United Nations might do. So can, can you kind of, is it, can you kind of explain that again? What, it, what, it, what, what is your role in that, all those data sets? Because they're oh. not our data sets, they're somebody else's. Oh, right. So the open data sets. So this is when students sometimes get assignments where they need to find information, right? Or maybe a faculty member needs to know what, what's out there, what exists. So as a librarian, I've essentially curated what those resources are. So these, I'm just putting them in one place where people can know, OK, I'm looking for energy data. Where might I look? as an example. It's like a list of resources, a bibliography. <laughs> do you want to explain it all? Like how, do you, how do you get that list of resources? Like how do, where do you decide what goes on that list? It has to be open. It has to be available. So some of these are all completely open access, where they have this little open access symbol, the unlocked lock. Um, and some of them have maybe just some information that's openly available. But this is not an exhaustive list. I'm always open for more information. Like Wayne just gave me some more tips about some LA and California data. I do have some of that, but I'm always learning more things and new things. I just want to make a my idea is that this is a, a place, a source, that people can go to when they need to get started on what data is available that's open and freely available. Do you have a way of knowing how much CSUN students use a particular link? I don't think so. I'm not on the analytics side of how what people are clicking on after they click on the so maybe we can find out Not who's currently. getting to my who's getting here but as far as who's clicking from here out to these other ones I don't think so we're currently moving to a new system that will allow for that level of analytics uh, for all of our guides I just want to know when Hold on a minute. I just want to know when was the last time you updated your list over there? 
was this maybe this over the summer yeah for the summer. Mm -hmm. do you have any updates for me I'm saying it's not. It's it's a living document. It's a living website. It's constantly. It's curated. It's constantly. I'm open for. If you find something and you say, "Hey, this is open," put that on your list and for this category, I'm happy to do that. How often do you do it? Like every, every. How often do you do it? As needed. Mm -hmm. Any other qu Any other questions? For these data files that come, do you just take them as is, or do you do something to standardize how they're presented to the students, like as you know, as a spreadsheet file of a particular type, or just comes as they are? Yeah, I'm just linking to the site. Just linking to the site. Mm -hmm. okay. On that note, do you want to just do a quick mention of Data Planet, maybe? Okay. <laughs> just because it ties into that question particularly. OK, thank you. Chris. Okay. So one of our newest acquisitions is Data Planet. And by the way, to find all of the library databases, you can go to the A through Z list. And Data Planet's at the top of the D category. And Data Planet is essentially like a massive um, <laughs> is it an aggregator? I'm not sure. It's a <laughs> of um, it's warming up. It's massive, so we've got to wait for it to <laughs> make itself available. It's a planet of data, and <laughs> so um, you just get when you first get here, you first see some things that are in the news, but they're it's very um, extensive. You get a lot of. Um, for example, if I click on the subjects, and each of these subjects have subtopics. Um, so, for example, education statistics, um, there, and there's, these are tons and tons of data sets. So, if I went to, let's see, public library statistics, um, I can see all different types of um, ways that I could take a look at this type of data. So, and I could add things, I could we're going to have a, aren't we, a training or a webinar that we're going to offer um, to help people utilize Data Planet for their own purposes. But we want to make sure that people know that this exists. This is part of the what the library can offer for for all of our CSUN patrons, and that we want people to know that they can actually layer data here in in uh, in Data Planet. So you can pick various data sets that you want to take a look at. Um, you can change things from year. You can look as far down as the, the data will let you. And you can change the view um, to look at rankings. Um, there's ways that you can actually, you can export the data. So you can um, allow it to go to Excel or SAS. Um, and then there's calculators in here. So when you start to layer the data, you can make calculations. Um, there's also, um, it creates, you can create a DOI um, of your own, the data that you are creating. And you also get the sources, so you can start to actually, it's great for teaching students where data is coming from and how to manipulate, um, when they manipulate data sets, how to actually, what, what citation looks like, what the um, DOI actually can do, what permalinks are. So it's, I think it's a one-stop place for a lot of great um, t you know teaching tools that I that I do incorporate so we've only just acquired this database um, as of the beginning of fall this this semester so I'm starting to teach it in my in my courses when I have my one-shot instructions here in the library especially for um, my marketing classes I teach marketing market research and marketing metrics um, I even even used it in a real estate class because there's some real estate data in here. So wherever it's useful, I try to incorporate it. Additional questions or comments? Yes. I just wanted to follow up on one of the questions about 
um, how the data is presented. You know, since let's say, for example, Sharice is linking to the U.S. Census Bureau. Once you're in there and you run a search, like an American Fact Finder, for example, then you can decide how you want to download the data, if you mm -hmm. want it in a spreadsheet or what have you. So it really depends on the data sets, but I want to make it clear that the library faculty are not creators of the data. They're basically data pushers, mm -hmm. okay? So um, we have content, just like journals and books. We're not creating the data, all right? So it really depends on the data set that you access, how you'll be able to manipulate the data. Is the contents of Data Planet all open? No, some of some of what's in Data Planet is, you know, like there's some that we have access to for, because I was nice and very smiley, please open this for my students. <laughs> but that particular section is very, very expensive. So we actually don't have, it's not part of our subscription. We just, they just turn certain things on for us. But um, the, I think from what's mostly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, what's in the base package is usually what's, from my understanding, what is mostly open, but you can layer it and it allows you to manipulate and visualize um, in one place. But there are other sections um, that are, you know, you can have sort of a scaffolded subscription where you can create more and more um, robust data visualizations based on the data set that you add on, that we don't have access to all of that, especially the marketing stuff. There's a lot of really great marketing, like consumer behavior stuff that Data Planet can offer that is not part of our subscription, but they turned on for us, so. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, let's give Sharissa an, a you. hand. So to round up this day of discussion of open data is Andrew Weiss, who is the uh, librarian, the digital services librarian who curates ScholarWorks and is our scholarly communications librarian. Okay. So uh, thank you for, for sticking it out. So um, I'm very concerned with uh, data management planning. Um, that's really been one of the, the main things that uh, I've been working on lately with the ScholarWorks repository. Um, so uh, we've done a lot with the repository itself over the past um, five years that I've been here. We've gone from just a few documents within the repository to, I would say, by next month to the beginning of next year, we'll be at around 20,000 items within the repository. So we've really grown uh, almost exponentially uh, with the, the size of the repository. But one of the areas that we haven't really worked, or at least we haven't really done very much with, has been with uh, data set uh, archiving and data management planning. And, and so today that's what I really want to focus on is um, sort of the, the areas where open access and data intersect. Um, so data management services then is the, sort of the, the area that we want to focus on today. Um, so obviously we are an open access repository and our week, this whole week is open access week and what does open access mean? We haven't really spent a whole lot of time talking about that today um, despite the fact that we are really focused on, on open access. Um, so when people talk about open access, there really are two different ways to go about it. First is this so-called gold road to open access, which uh, essentially entails people publishing uh, an article within an open access journal, but the author then will supply the, the payment for publication. So this is known as uh, an author processing charge, an APC. Um, so these charges essentially range from around $500 to $3,000 uh, plus, for example, the Public Library of Science. Uh, those are roughly around $1,500 for plus. They, they have a very strong model for gold open access publishing. They're, they're really the, 
the gold standard, so to speak, for, for gold open access publishing. And they've gotten their, their APC charges down to around $1,500 per, uh, per article, um, which is somewhat reasonable, especially if you have grant funding to, to cover that. And I would say that nowadays, most grants, most uh, of the federal grant fund, funded uh, funders, uh, they will allow you to, to write in money for uh, paying for open access charges. Um, and that can be, of course, part of then of, as part of your uh, as part of your open access requirements or as part of your, your data management planning. Um, you can write in some money into your grant to, to cover those charges. The other side, of course, of open access is what I focus on in particular, which is the green road to open access. So uh, repositories, institutional repositories, and uh, those include, for example, of course, ScholarWorks, SOAR is one such institutional repository. Um, there are also subject repositories. So many disciplines, for example, um, physics and mathematics, they are working with this uh, subject repository known as Archive, which is based out of uh, Cornell University. Um, and then, of course, there are also data repositories. And those were spoken about a little bit in the, in the previous, uh, in the previous um, uh, presentations uh, regarding data and of course data site working with you know over 900 data sets 900 data funders uh, or uh, data collectors um, so for example there's the geodata repository and there's climate change data portal etc there's uh, also an open access directory of data repositories so um, these are all of course the green road to open access so you're not dealing with article processing charges Often you're dealing with articles that have already been published in the past, um, and we're just taking an earlier draft of a work and putting it into our repository. Um, we have about, for example, with uh, our repository here on campus, we have almost uh, 2,000 articles that are part of the green open access uh, publishing. So previous drafts or even articles that have been published in an open access journal, we have copies of those within our repository. Um, so, and, and these are all you know, across multiple disciplines, although they do tend to sort of cluster within particular disciplines, uh, especially within the STEM fields, um, and primarily within things such as uh, astronomy and, and physics, et cetera. Um, they have a, a very strong open access component within their discipline. Um, the humanities, for example, tends to not be so strong with, uh, within open access. Um, so open access is our topic. However, and this is something that I like to focus on a lot, how does it help you? How does it help uh, scholars to have something within open access? And again, this does sort of pan out as very discipline specific. Um, so there is such a thing, and it's been studied for the past 15 years, this thing called the open access citation advantage. Um, and several studies over the years have found uh, ranging from 69% increase in the number of citations to something like 480% increase in the number of citations uh, based on whether something was published in open access or exists in open access or is in, closed, in a closed publication. Um, so Lawrence, for example, finds in 2001 that there was a 157% increase in the number of citations for particular disciplines within that study. Um, and then over time, over the years from 2004 to 2007 and 2009, they find ranging uh, uh, variations in the number of citations increased by publishing within open access. Um, so they see it as a very established uh, phenomenon happening when something is published within open access. This also applies to data. And so this is where it gets very interesting and, and where it fits within our theme today. Um, so open access to data also has been shown to increase citations. Um, one great study by POR and Vision from 2013, they examined about 10,000 publications. Uh, and these are publications uh, related to the human genome, so a very specific uh, discipline. Um, and overall, they found that if something had open data associated with it, a uh, publication published with the open data sets, that they found a 9% increase in the number of citations for those articles between the years of 2001 and 2009. So that's the, the period of time when they did their study. Um, 
And so they, they found, uh, one of their conclusions was that they found that um, the authors themselves cited their papers the most within the first couple years of publication of that, of that data set. But then data reuse later, so other people are coming into the, into the picture then later. So within uh, about six years, so for at least six years, they started to find citations were accumulating more from third parties. Um, so they're finding that there is a very much a distinct uh, bump, if you will, in terms of the, the citations for your paper if it's published with an open data set. Um, and then you can see uh, here's one of the, the data visualizations that they used in the paper. For just one, one year, the 2002 year, they found, for example, that here's uh, the citations per year, number of citations per paper appears to be, when it's not available, it shows up as a little bit less, whereas if it's published with that open data set, you can see there's a, a, a distinct uh, increase in the number of citations for the papers. But then also there is this area, too, of overlap, so where there's perhaps no distinction between whether it was published openly or, or not openly, um, the data set, I mean. Um, so they found that of 10,000 plus papers, that there were 9,700 plus instances of data reuse by third parties. So again, this is speaking to uh, really the, the, the use of that data. So data, once it's put out there, does get used. And they're finding that um, it is then, of course, impacting the papers that have been published with open data. OK, so uh, here at CSUN, there are quite a number of open access mandates and resolutions that do impact all, all uh, scholars directly, all of our faculty directly. Obviously, on the international scale, the, uh, the CSUN President Harrison, President Harrison has um, signed the Berlin Declaration to open, open Access. So this is an international agreement that open access is a good thing. Um, it doesn't really force us to do anything in particular. It's just sort of a, a statement of purpose, in a sense, uh, a statement that this is a, a good direction to go into. Um, we also have the federal mandates regarding open access. And these are really what impact faculty, particularly on the point of grant funding. So when you do go for grants and when you're writing your grants, um, many of the ones, many of the agencies that have more than $100 million in funding, um, and I have a list in that handout that I gave to everyone. Um, there's a list of all of the requirements for data management planning. Um, they're essentially mandating that you have to publish your works into open access and that also that you would have to share the data. And so many of them are looking for you to, to, to meet those requirements. Um, and so that, that really impacts us uh, financially uh, as an institution when you do go for federal grants. Um, at the state level, there's also something known as the California Assembly Bill 609 from 2014, I believe, the fall of 2014 this was passed. This is the California Taxpayer Access to Publicly Funded Research Act. So it's, it started off as a broad state-funded open access resolution, and as it went through the process, it got uh, slowly narrowed down. So now the scope is pretty much just the California State De Department of Health. So anything related to those grants, anything grant funded from them, ends up having to be open access. Um, it was meant to be sort of a very broad, anything you know, state funded by the state of California would be an open access, but the political process sort of mm, uh, whittled down some of the power for, for that particular bill. Um, and then of course locally, we have our CSUN uh, electronic thesis and dissertations projects. Uh, so these are default open access in ScholarWorks, and this has been in effect for the past uh, four years now. Uh, and then we also have a, a, a Faculty Senate open access resolution passed in late to 2013. Again, this is really very much a, a recommendation, very similar to perhaps the Berlin Declaration that open access is a good thing, a good direction to go into, but there really, at this point, there is no, uh, there is no way to, to force people into into agreeing or, or to acting on, on behalf of the, the resolution. Um, but anyway, these are sort of the, the directions that we're going and the ways that, that impact us in terms of open access. Um, 
Okay, yes, and here's that list of all of the, the funder mandates uh, regarding open access, so I won't belabor the, the point. Um, just that, uh, is a data management plan required? And you can see that pretty much for all of these, except for the Smithsonian, which requires a partial one, um, these federal funders are requiring that there is some sort of data management plan involved. And so um, that, of course, means that you're going to have to eventually share your data uh, with uh, the outside world, whether you, whether you like it or not, I guess. Um, so um, data management planning then. And, and this is really where uh, we're sort of in the beginning stages here with ScholarWorks uh, in creating and, and helping to create data management plans for faculty. Um, one of the areas that, that we want to focus on for the future is to help with uh, getting grants, of course, securing grants and working with the Office of Research and Sponsored Projects. Um, and at the same time, we also want to provide um, that sort of base for preservation, for digital preservation of data. Um, and, and that's really what ScholarWorks is all about as well. It's meant to be uh, a repository. Uh, so for the sake of long-term preservation of items related to the university. Um, so what we do then is we focus on sort of the whole process of research then. So the before, the during, and the after of your research. So in all of your projects, you, you follow this cycle. Um, but at the same time, you, start, you need to start to consider what are going to be some of the issues before you even start to do your experimentation. Um, so there are some copyright, there are some ethical concerns when you do generate data and you believe that you may have to share some of that data. Um, so there are issues with, for example, if you uh, start to gather private data or data that's sort of regulated by FERPA, the FERPA guidelines, uh, for, for student privacy, um, you, you're going to have to start to uh, consider how this data then could be shared. You may have to go through a process of uh, cleaning up your data or removing or redacting information from that data that might compromise uh, the privacy of the individuals or uh, people who are involved with, with the data gathering or within the data set. Um, so, Funding agencies have very specific guidelines, and, and obviously I recommend as you go through your project and you're developing your grants, you do have to look at what are the, the guidelines then for, for data sharing. That's absolutely essential. Um, and then we do have then, um, as part of the handout that I gave you also, there's a, a way to write a data management plan. There are sections that you can sort of follow that pretty much every data management plan is going to follow. Um, you can see here on this particular sheet here, um, starting with the overview and then talking about you know, the types of data that might be involved with your, your set, et cetera. Um, so we can help you with data management planning templates, um, sort of developing your, your narrative, as, as it were, um, for the data management plan. Um, we also work with the Office of Research and Sponsored Projects to create, uh, we've created already boilerplate language, essentially, for, that you can insert into your grant um, that talks about ScholarWorks, talks about um, you know, what ScholarWorks or what kind of uh, steps are taken by the library to help you with managing your data. Um, and of course, uh, we have staff here uh, at the library related to uh, the repository. So, of course, Elizabeth, myself, and then also uh, Martha Steele. There are the three of us who are the, sort of the core staff for the repository. We can help with uh, data management plans. Um, and then, of course, you also have during and after. So, during the whole project, obviously, then um, there are best practices for documentation and for creating metadata for data um, in order to, to help sort of organize it as you're doing your, your experimentation, but also to, to help it then as you're ready to, as you're ready to use it or, or to preserve it for later, then um, those, those guidelines can help you with that. Um, you know, saving data, for example, file naming, privacy, security, all of that, in, all of that is sort of entailed with, uh, with working with your data. Um, I, I would suggest keeping that in mind as you're working with the data. Um, and then, of course, afterwards, once you're done with the data, what do you do with it? Um, so ScholarWorks itself is designed to preserve it. Um, we preserve the files. 
Um, so um, we have this thing called the, the data submission checklist. And that checklist essentially goes through a series of questions that you would ask yourself, you know, whether this data is appropriate for an open access repository, whether it's appropriate for maybe a subject repository. So obviously, we wouldn't mind having your data within ScholarWorks, but there may be more appropriate venues as well. There may be some venues that uh, are much more appropriate for your particular discipline. Um, so again, if you go through a series of steps, you can sort of judge for yourself whether it's appropriate to, to put the data openly or to, to have it embargoed for a period of time. Um, so again, these are all kind of questions to, to begin to, to ask yourself. Um, and then, of course, maybe the last part might be, you know, you might want to add some documentation for people in the future who might want to reuse the data or if you might want them to, to have some understanding of the context from which the data was derived and those kinds of things. So it's important to, to start to think about uh, the long term for the data itself. All right, and, and I mentioned briefly the, the data management plan sample. So um, talking about, of course, uh, an overview, but then the types of data that you might expect to create during your project, um, that's important to, to, to consider. Um, the data storage and preservation, so where are you going to put it as you're using it, where are you going to put it then afterwards with, once you're done with it. Um, the retention of the data, um, how, how are you going to uh, devise ways in order to, to make sure that the, the data is you know, essentially retainable by you. Uh, uh, retrievable by you over the, over the long term as well. And then also, how are you going to go about sharing and disseminating that data? So again, the plan really does go through all of those steps and, and, uh, in, in very uh, detailed fashion. Um, OK. And so ScholarWorks itself, too. We've talked a little bit about ScholarWorks. ScholarWorks can be used as a data management tool. Um, so we focus primarily these days on the thesis projects, on faculty publications, but we are also looking to, to archive data as well. Um, so our main collections here, um, working on, on a whole different range of things, also university archives, so we're collecting uh, documents, documentation from various uh, entities on campus, different, uh, different departments, different uh, uh, centers on campus. Um, so, and this is actually a, a CSU mandate. So, the CSU has mandated a state mandate, really, that we have to we have to archive our documents at the C, at CSUN. Um, so, the faculty senate has to to uh, collect its documents. Uh, all these other organizations within campus also have to archive their documents, and so. That's something I think is just the tip of the iceberg. We're, we're going to get a deluge of, of documents uh, related to the archives. And then, of course, we're talking about data repositories. Um, and as far as ScholarWorks goes, it doesn't really matter what file types we're using. Um, we can pretty much ingest any kind of file type. Um, so ranging from you know PDF, doc, docx, et cetera, LaTeX files, MP3, MP4, et cetera, proprietary. Um, people have written their own scripts, have written their own programs, essentially, to parse the data that they've created. That can also be ingested as well within the system. All right. Um, and then I, I spoke a little bit about um, that checklist for submitting your, your, your data. So I, I won't go through that. Um, but essentially, you want to ask yourself, is it appropriate for a repository? Um, and is it? Uh, you know, appropriate for an open access repository, and that's that's really the key. So, issues of privacy, issues of, of other kinds of uh, proprietary data, data, for example, that that might come into play as well as you make your decisions. All right, and then of course, Dr. Dudgeon, we've worked together uh, several times, um, and um, you can see an example of, of what he's done by submitting his work into ScholarWorks. Uh, we have a number of his data sets from his experiments, many of them from uh, the 1990s. Um, so it doesn't matter how old the data is. I think it, it's all relevant then. Um, and then you know, that's just one of the areas in which he's kept his uh, data. There are other repositories where he's also uh, submitted his data and, and allowed it to be shared. And, and I think. Um, 
that's really the important thing is um, finding the appropriate venue for the data, uh, finding the right spot for it, and um, then sharing it with, uh, with the, the wider world. All right, and then of course, um, if you have more questions or if you, have, uh, if you need more information and assistance, um, all of us are, are pretty much, uh, uh, I guess, uh, attuned to you know, the various needs for open access. Uh, in my case, mostly related to data management planning and, and ScholarWorks itself, ETDs, et cetera. But Elizabeth also um, is working on the repository as well, as well as ETDs. And, and we provide letters of support for grants. Um, I didn't provide it with the handout, but we do have uh, boilerplate letters that we also write and, and we provide for, for grants that, that might require them. Um, Chris, of course, is uh, very much uh, working with open access journals and serials, so he's our expert in that area. Um, data repository, so he's also a person to, to ask. Um, Charissa, who just spoke, she also does a lot of great work with reference and helping people do re actual research with the data sets that we either subscribe to or that we have uh, curated for student use um, as well as faculty use. Uh, and then Martha also, Martha Steele, she's uh, part of the ScholarWorks repository, uh, ScholarWorks assistant. She does a lot of the, the data ingest. She'll work with a lot of the, the files that get put into ScholarWorks. Um, so we have uh, quite a number of uh, services and, and uh, we hope to, to work with you in the future. So that's all I have. Thank you. Questions? Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, we'll wait. I, I was surprised to see how much this open access increased the number of citations. Uh, yes. uh, simply because. Uh, most of these uh, institutions and people who work in that this particular area, they, they have access to these journals. So do we right. know why that happens? Why, why is open access giving such a big gain? That's a good question. Um, I think some of it is uh, a lot of countries are unable to afford a lot of these databases. So I think they're finding that a lot of the access to many of the open access publications comes from many poor countries, such as the ones in Africa, for example, or some in Asia, in other parts of the world that don't, are really essentially not able to afford, you know, a $30,000 okay. journal. Okay. Uh, yeah, that that's makes, makes sense. That, that's uh, one argument. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's how we got signed up. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly, one, one, yeah. Yeah, one, one, yeah. Another thing, uh, this is not directly related to what, what you were presenting, but uh, uh, th there's been a lot of over the years, there's been a lot of talk about the impact factor of, of journals. So, right. uh, yeah. uh, what, what, what is the best metric nowadays for for normalizing these uh, within a <laughs> discipline? Because you know, uh, for a mathematician, impact factor of one for a journal could be great. Mm -hmm. For a biologist, it could be a disaster. Yeah? Right. Yeah. And so th there are some normalized uh, I indices like this. So, do we know anything about them? It, that's a great question. I know that. Um, there have been some studies about problems with impact factors. They found that you know journals that have higher impact factors actually have a higher rate of error mm -hmm. than journals that are actually lower on the impact factor scale. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's one problem. I think um, the issue then is that um, impact factors have become you know sort of the standard for many disciplines, and yet at the same time nowadays there's also sort of what they call the alt metrics. So um, they have alt metric scores. Um, so those are sort of slowly coming into the fore. I think they're trying to displace the, the impact factor as the main, as one of the main. Because the, the, the yes. main problem really varies so much between right. different disciplines that it's very, it's impossible to compare. Yeah, and, and maybe that is really the issue itself, is that every discipline ends up being different and that it just has to be analyzed within that particular discipline only. Despite the fact that we're all trying to sort of go across disciplines now, and so that, I, I think you raise a great point, yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult problem. Any other questions for Andrew? Wayne, you look like you want to say something. So I want to ask 
that question. Um, <laughs> on ScholarWorks, is there even a very minimal capability to do any kind of dynamic work, like for example, upload a zip file that's a couple of terabytes, and then when it's downloaded, they can either download the zip file, download it unzipped, or have it convert in the back end to a tarball or something like that. Well, and and, and it, then from there, we could go up to more dynamic services rather yes. than just file conversion. They could actually do dynamic visualizations, things that Wikipedia has added over time. Well, I, I can speak to the first one. You can definitely put zip files, um, even structured folders within ScholarWorks, and then they can display. For example, we've done that with web pages where they will display within ScholarWorks as sort of an archived uh, web set of web pages. Um, but I, I can't really speak to So the you can't fireballs. download a terabyte of anything just over HTTP anyway, um, because it just won't, you'll time out before you get finished. And that's part of the other issue. Um, as, unless I'm mistaken, somebody tell me if I'm wrong. But well, we've had this problem going up. A terabyte? Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, that's, that's, that's the distro is smaller than that. Okay, yeah, so we're just using web protocols, so you, oh. but we do have archived larger files that you can have access to. I was trying to give an example of the most minimal capability to do a little bit of dynamic work without having to program the back end like Amazon Web Services. So it's an archive. <clears throat> People might want things in more than one format. And that so you can we do. Would, right. we would, it, would, it can automatically convert formats in the background, or we would upload the data in more than one format. You would upload the data in more than one yes. format. OK, so there's no dynamic capability. I'm not arguing that that's Don't, a uh, I'm just trying to s So we, can talk, about the, we yeah. can talk about that we're moving to a new platform within the next Right. Um, yeah. Currently, the platform we use is a rather old one called DSpace, um, developed by Hewlett Packard and MIT back in 1999, maybe 2000. Um, so we're moving away from that one to a new one called Hydra, which um, should have at least a little bit more better capabilities. Um, but I, I don't know if I can really speak to the dynamic part of it. But those automatic conversions. Yeah. I mean, part of it. I'm sorry. I'm talking to. No, no, no. Go ahead. I mean, uh, I, there are certain format registries that are archival, but then there's also other types of formats that people might want to actually use, as you say. And I think that we could have dynamic programs eventually that could convert upon upload, but those would have to be built in. And I think the issue is when right. you have a standard tool is having to build in the conversion. You'd have to have the ability to convert anything to anything almost with that. And we, we're not quite there yet. Anything but else? we want to be. Yeah, we, we <laughs> wanted to do everything. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I just want to say a, a few words. Thank you very, very much to Wayne and Yoko and um, the rest of the planning committee for putting this together. It was wonderful that you all stayed here this long. And uh, we hope we can do something very similar next year. Do you want to say anything? Well, I was just going to say we probably want to send as soon as we get the video archived somewhere in a reasonable format, um, we'll or more than one format, um, <laughs> right, starting with AUG, um, uh, then we would uh, send them everyone an email so they know where everything is. Yes. Or put it on the same page. It'll there's, probably be linked on the link, page. That there's you a link to the collection for this conference on the, on the um, RSVP page. On the uh, abstract on the um, presentations and abstracts page. So there will be a link to that collection. It will just grow out as we get everything on there. We just didn't get some things till today. So and thank you very much to Tony for being our videographer today. <laughs>